Of the 10 women on death row in Texas, half stand convicted of crimes involving the murder, abduction, or endangerment of a child. Darlie Routier is married to her high school sweetheart and raising three boys in an affluent Dallas suburb when in June of 1996, two of her children are found brutally stabbed to death on her living room floor. Though Darley had summoned police to the crime scene, within 20 minutes of their arrival, she had become the lead suspect in the case. Her arrest came rapidly, and only seven months later, Darley Routier was sentenced to capital punishment. In the next hour, renowned filmmaker Werner Herzog speaks with Darley about her children, her case, and her life on death row. Death penalty exists in 33 states of the United States of America. However, in recent years, a much smaller number has actually performed them. Executions are carried out by lethal injection. As a German, coming from a different historical background and being a guest in the United States, I respectfully disagree with the practice of capital punishment. Gatesville, Texas. This is the Mountain View Correctional Facility. A van arrives with a single female inmate inside, barely visible, like a specter. This is Darley Routier, sentenced to death for the murder of her two children. Because of a potential suicide risk, prison authorities have dressed her in a gown made of tissue paper. Mountain View Unit is a prison for women, which also houses the handful of female death row inmates in Texas. She will remain here until her execution, which will take place in the death chamber in Huntsville, some 150 miles away. Looking at the scene reminds me of medieval passion plays of my home, Bavaria. Do you have any comments? Is there anything you would like to say? Darlie Rotier, you have been here at Mountain View Unit on death row for how long? I came here early February 1997. Which means 15 years now. Yes, sir. How does this isolation feel for you? How do you cope with it? <sighs> well... <clears throat> I think that I'm very blessed to have a lot of um, family, friends, supporters that um, are very encouraging, um, supportive in my fight. Um, it is hard. It is a very, um, you're isolated. You're isolated from the world. You're cut off from your family, from life. This was Darlie Routier's world in Rawlett, a suburb of Dallas. The neighborhood looks affluent, big homes, manicured lawns, nothing points to the darkest imaginable crimes. But it was from here, the Routier's home, that an emergency call was made at 2.31 on the morning of June 6, 1996. The caller was Darlie Routier. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Come on, try to get an ambulance to you. No, no, no. What's going on, ma'am? Oh, my God! 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 Oh, my God!
Two of Darlie's boys were stabbed to death. Her third child, a boy just seven months old, slept upstairs and remained unharmed. This is Damon on the left and Devon, the older one, to the right. They were five and six when they died. You were tried only, only for the death of your younger son, Damon. Yes. Which means uh, this made it a capital murder case because he was under six. Right. He was only five. Yes. How do you remember the child, the boy? How do I remember Damon? Yes, how do you remember him? Damon was a lot different from Devin. Damon was, he was a little more shy. He was um, a big mama's boy. <laughs> he was the type that, um, he was more quieter, but he, he loved to play with all the other kids, but he was more quiet. He wasn't, you know, as loud. And um, where Devin was more, he was funny. He was um, always, making jokes and being silly and but when they when they were together they balanced each other let's assume for some reasons uh, you will be released from death row authorities still can charge you with the murder of your other boy is that correct technically they can um, the way that the trial was played out even though i was only i was on trial for damon's the whole, during the whole trial, it wasn't just about Damon. It was about Devin and Damon. Um, the work that's being done in the case to prove my innocence, it's not going to just prove that I did not murder Damon. It's going to prove that I did not murder either of my children. Back to the crime scene. As investigators gathered evidence, their suspicions quickly turned to Darley. Even the first responder soon had his doubts. David Waddell, can you tell me what you saw? When I first pulled up in front of the house, I saw a man running out the front door. Um, I got out of my car, I yelled at him, had him stop in the front yard to see who he was. Uh, it was Darren Routier. The husband? Yes, Darley's husband. I asked him what he was doing. He told me that he did live at the house and he was going across the street to find a nurse who lived across the street. What was the scene? What did you see? She was still on the telephone talking to the dispatcher, trying to describe what was going on. Um, I saw the two boys in the living room floor. Uh, one of them obviously uh, deceased already. Um, the other one was moving along the floor and she was standing a few feet away from him, talking on the phone. Moving along the floor, meaning? Just maybe almost like a slow crawl. Um, he was bleeding, gurgling for breath. Um, it was apparent that it was obvious that he was still alive. I'll never forget his face. Um, he was looking up at us with his eyes open. Gurgling blood, looking just like he, he was scared. Was fear. He knew he was dying. I believe so. When investigators enter the Rudier house in Dalrock Heights, they walk into a nightmare. Two of Darley and Darren Rudier's young boys have been savagely attacked with a knife. Darren, Darren did come back from across the street. And I told him to try to help the other boy, and he did. He tried to help the one in the middle of the living room. I don't recall the names or which one was which, but um, at one point I remember looking over at him to see if he was helping him, and he was doing CPR. And with each breath, there was a shower of blood coming out of the little boy's chest, and it was it was obvious that he was he was gone. And Darley herself. Darley was standing by the bar between the kitchen and the living room. Um, I really wasn't concerned about her boys because she, she asked me about her jewelry 
that was sitting on the counter. She asked me if anybody had stolen her jewelry. Um, she told me she messed with the, the butcher knife that was used to kill her kids. She told me she'd grabbed it and uh, messed up the fingerprints on it. I believe there was an intruder in the house up until the, we actually searched the house and didn't find one. I thought he was, I thought he was still in the house um, until my backup arrived and we were able to search and make sure he wasn't. Until then, I was expecting to come around the corner any time. And apparently there was no intruder. No. Um, it was just, it was a day like any other day, you know. Um, I had gone to sleep. Um, the boys were sleeping with downstairs with me. And um, the next thing I remember is Damon on my shoulder. And he was pushing on my shoulder. And he was saying, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And when I first, you know, woke, I could see a man that was going into the kitchen. Well, I got up. Damon followed behind him me. Because TV was on. The TV was on. We had a big screen TV behind us. And light was still on. Or yes, was yes. And um, as I got up, Damon followed behind me. And by the time I got to the corner of the kitchen, I could see the man going out into the utility room, out into the garage. One thing that I am puzzled about is the uh, wounds that you sustained. Were they not uh, a strong evidence for your truthfulness? Uh, yes, I believe so. My can you describe, my neck the, can was, you describe the attack? My on? neck was cut from one side to the can other. Can we still see it? It was said on a stand that by the doctor that um, did the surgery, that the carotid artery was actually nicked, but it was not cut the whole way through. And they said, had it been cut two millimeters more, which is a very, very tiny, tiny amount, that I would have bled to death within minutes. We wouldn't sit I would not be here sitting together. here today. Yes. I was stabbed in the arm. I was stabbed. Do we still see a scar? Yeah. Can you lift it higher first? Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. Greg Davis, you were a prosecutor in case Darley Routier. What kind of person did you encounter? You know, I encountered someone that I didn't expect to encounter. Um, because when I got involved in this case, the very last thing that I expected was to find a mother who had killed her two children. Uh, that, that was a foreign concept to me. So. When we got into the case, what I encountered was someone uh, who was depraved, who was evil, who was selfish, who was self-focused, and who was in a state of denial, quite frankly, about what she had done in this case. And when you look at Darley, you see someone who is caught up in her own life, who wants things her way, who is unhappy with her state of affairs, who's having financial problems, having marital problems, and I think who saw these two children as, as impediments to what she wanted. What we found when we looked at the records was that these people were in such financial straits that they had applied for a loan shortly before the murders, and they had been turned down for that loan because their finances were in such poor condition. They were behind on their mortgage. They were behind on credit card payments. They were living beyond their means. They were living large, as they would say. Furniture, uh, cars, uh, boats, uh, vacations. I mean, they were living a grand lifestyle uh, that, that if you and I had looked from the outside, we said, these people are doing great. But on the inside, they were hemorrhaging money, and they simply couldn't afford that lifestyle in reality. Besides, Darley seemed to have contemplated suicide, writing a note in her diary to her children. work for Darley, trying to get the word out there that she's innocent. And last resort would be maybe clemency. 
by the governor. Darley and I won't accept life in prison. Uh, right from the beginning, she said she'd rather be dead than to live her life for, in prison for something she didn't do. So um, we fight for her innocence, for her to be freed, or at least get a new trial. But worst case scenario, if she doesn't get a new trial, if procedures go on, are you prepared for the worst case scenario? No, I'm not. I will never be prepared for that. If they kill her, they kill me. So, uh, I know it's a possibility. Uh, I hope I'm not here if that happens. How would you face a moment like that? Is there anything? I, I would not watch her execution. I would not watch them murder my daughter. And she wouldn't want that. I don't know what I'll do. But for 15 years now, all appeals have been denied. Darley is still being kept in this solitary cell awaiting execution. It looks like a gesture of defiance that Darley has herself photographed in prison as if she were taking a short break from normal life. From the moment of her arrest, she has proclaimed her innocence. From death row, Darley Rudier continues to proclaim she's innocent of murdering her two young boys. Now, Werner Herzog speaks with the investigators on the case. And in Darley Rudier's case, you are completely convinced that the right person is I'm completely, convicted. absolutely convinced. There's no, there's no, no doubt in my mind. Uh, and, and you don't know me well enough to know this. If I had any doubt, I would tell you very quickly. But I do not. No doubt. And you look at the sum total, everything there points to Darley. There's absolutely nothing that points to anyone else. I had uh, initially some reservation about there were two people in that house. So I was uh, concerned about uh, Darren Routier as well. This is Darren Routier, the husband who was also in the house. He has since divorced Darley and remarried. Ever since the crime, he has steadfastly proclaimed her innocence. This is very, uh, very stressful, very uh, anxiety. You know, it's just very difficult to uh, to see my wife being portrayed as someone she's not. And when uh, when the time comes out, you're going to see a totally different picture because to to know Darley is to love her. Quite obvious to me that the, the story that she spun was not true, not even close to the truth. Might give her a mistake or two, but the whole scenario did not fit. Does not fit today. Didn't fit. Didn't fly then. It won't fly now. I kept asking the police, "Tell me again, what what is her story here? What did she say happened? Let me try to make sense of this." I just couldn't make sense of it using her her story. And then then when you find, as the police did, the the screen that had been cut. And then you find the knife inside her kitchen that had the particles on it that were identical to the particles on the screen that had been cut. Then you really have a problem, don't you? Because now you have to believe that an intruder came somehow magically into the home. He then took a bread knife from her kitchen. He cut the screen in a nice, neat T pattern. And then he puts the knife back in and then picks up another knife out of her kitchen and commits these horrible crimes. It just, it becomes more fantastic every time that you look at another piece of physical evidence here. Uh, that knife was a rounded tip bread knife. If you've seen a to cut bread, uh, it's serrated. That knife couldn't have went in that screen and cut it. What we've found out since... Why, why couldn't it do that? 
because it has a round tip. Why would you use a serrated round tip knife when you've got a whole block of knives to cut that screen? I mean, you've got, it doesn't make any sense. We do know this. We know that she went to great efforts to stage a crime scene. We know, for instance, the lamp, I mean, the flower arrangement in the, in the den where the two children were, it's staged when it's knocked over. We know the vacuum cleaner in the kitchen. We know that Darlie Routier placed that after the fact. There are bloody footprints underneath there, and those bloody footprints match the footprints of Darlie Routier. Let's go back through Darlie's story, right? The intruder, she wakes up. The intruder's running away from her. He breaks the glass before she ever gets in the kitchen. Uh, she chases this man through the kitchen where he then conveniently drops the knife in the utility room for her. So then she backs away and eventually calls the police. The, uh, the blood underneath the vacuum cleaner again. Um, the blood on the vacuum cleaner. Uh, again, her blood uh, that is shown to be dropping straight down on to the blood onto the vacuum cleaner the blood that's on the handle of the vacuum cleaner that again is her blood consistent with her actually taking the handle and laying it down the marks where you can see where the vacuum cleaner was rolled on that floor in the blood before it was dropped on the f on the floor itself i mean that's just some of the physical evidence in the kitchen that would contradict everything that she said here's here's the the bigger problem with all of the blood and all the dna in this case and let's let's remember at the time that this case was tried no case had ever had more dna samples tested in it in this state now, I mean, we had more than 100 dna samples tested we literally were able to create a dna map for that home in that crime scene of all those 100 dna samples we had zero none that were unidentified all of those samples could be linked to one of three people either Devon, damon or darlie routier there's nothing to indicate that anybody else was ever in that home so no there's there's no intruder uh there's no mystery killer this isn't a, a new episode of the fugitive where we have a one-armed man free out here running free that's just not that's not the facts here stephen cooper you are dolly routier's post-conviction attorney what's her line of defense well primarily the uh, issue is that she is innocent in fact and the uh, we have evidence developed since the trial that clearly demonstrates that and uh, we hope to develop some more with some dna tests that are pending or that we hope to get ordered soon the evidence that the state elicited was based primarily almost exclusively on opinions of experts who were not qualified to render those opinions, um, didn't do the necessary um, background investigation in order Give me one example, please. Well, um, the uh, a fellow named James Cron came into the scene here at four or five o'clock in the morning, and it was horrific, bloody scene um, evidence, i.e. blood, evidence, and other things throughout the house. And he, by his own testimony in front of the jury, said that he concluded in his walkthrough, within 20 minutes of being there, that Darley did it. And so he formed that opinion without having the blood spatter evidence, without having done any, any of the forensic stuff that is needed to do in a, in a messy crime scene. He had already concluded that she was guilty. And that, that, um, that biased the rest of the investigation because from 20 minutes onto the scene, they were then investigating evidence, quote, evidence to prove that she was guilty, not developing evidence to determine who may have committed this crime. We now return to the details of the investigation that put Darley Routier on death row. There's one uh, strange, mysterious item, a sock, bloody, found about 75 yards in an alley. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, we know that the sock contained the blood of the two boys. We know that from yes. analysis. I found, it, I found it strange that the sock was found next to a storm drain 
uh, and it was laying out exposed as though whoever left it there wanted it to be found. Um, if you're going, if you're going to try to hide evidence, you don't do it that way. What you do is you either a you throw it in a trash can in the alley, or you throw it down the storm drain. But you don't leave it out there as though it's just a marker. Say, look at me, find me, and that's really what that thing was. And I, I don't know when that was planted, but I think that was planted by Darley at some point in the, in the night. The state's theory is that she killed these children, and then staged the crime scene, part of which was taking a sock that had both Devon and Damon's blood on it, as well as faint DNA of my client on it, and took it down the alley 75 yards. And you would exclude uh, theories that bloody socks levitate? I would exclude that. And you would exclude that a bloody sock has wheels and travels 75 yards? Not this bloody sock. I've seen it. Do you have an explanation how it was possible that drips of blood of her sons ended up on the back of her nightgown? I do. I think that when she was, she stabbed these boys so hard, uh, just, just the motion of the knife going up and down would put some drops on the back of her shirt. Um, they were stabbed hard enough to where it went, the knife went through their body and actually chipped the concrete floor underneath them. That's a lot of force. I think that her hand would have to go, go back pretty far behind her back or over her head. Their explanation for how, if, if she had stabbed the children and then cut herself, how they would all be in these microscopic dots is that miraculously these pieces of, of drops of blood flew in the air and landed on top of the blood that was already there from uh, killing the boys. We have experts that says the mathematical possibilities of that happening are just extreme. Let's not forget that the boy's blood is also found on the front of her shirt. We're not talking about transfers now. We're not talking about smudges where the boys are grabbing or she's rubbing up on the boys. These again are droplets of blood on both the front shoulder of right and left, right, uh, the right and left, okay? And the patterns are such that we could tell, the experts could tell, that the blood droplets are actually going upwards. And they're on the outside of the shirt, again, consistent with that knife being repeatedly brought up and some of the blood, again, off the tip or the edge, coming up off of there and depositing on the T-shirt itself in both places. Again, the blood of both boys are found on those blood droplets. All of those droplets, all of those patterns are consistent, again, with her using that knife repeatedly to stab the two boys. That's, you know, that's what the evidence shows. All fingerprints were identified with the exception of one mm -hmm. smudged and um, allegedly it might be the intruder's fingerprint. From what I understand that fingerprint was not identifiable. It's, it could have been it, it, it was, there's finger, obviously there's fingerprints all over your house. If you live in a house, there's fingerprints everywhere on everything. Um, that fingerprint was analyzed and it was just, it was smudged and you couldn't, it, it couldn't be read. Today it's a big deal for the defense that this must be the uh, fingerprint of the intruder, the alleged intruder. I think it's probably their last hope. Um, which I don't, the fingerprint is, I don't, I don't think there's any value to it. The fingerprint does not match Darley, Darren's, any of the police officers, any of the paramedics, any of the detectives, or the boys. So whose fingerprint is in blood at the crime scene? I think it cannot be identified according to the state's testimony because it's too smudged to... Uh, that's wrong. Um, we have had four experts, independent, look at it. Uh, their expert tried to downplay it 
because if you follow the chain of custody of that fingerprint, they took it out of evidence for two weeks. I'm sure they were trying to match it with somebody's. Well, I've heard that same claim for 15 years now, and I keep waiting for them to produce some sort of evidence that would show someone else was in that home. They can't do that. See, here's, here's the situation. When I'm in a courtroom, I'm bound by certain things. I'm bound by the truth first and foremost. I'm also bound by rules of evidence and procedure. The Routier family's not bound by any of that. For 15 years, they've been free to make whatever claim they want to, to uh, distort the evidence as they see fit, to rewrite the testimony at, at trial. Uh, and again, they can make any claim that they want to. I've heard claims about fingerprints and they fail to back those claims up. I've heard claims about DNA, they don't back those claims up. About every five years there's another new unexplained claim that comes up from the family, but they never ever produce any evidence that undermines that jury's verdict in this case. The jury's verdict against Darlie Routier was certainly influenced by this video. It was taken eight days after the murders. Darlie Released from hospital, seems to have recovered. She is celebrating the birthday of Devon at his gravesite. Happy birthday, dear Devon. Here, on the left, her seven months old boy, who had been with his father upstairs when the murders occurred. The video had devastating effect for her, with the public and the jury. Her arrest came the very next day. Whenever she had to appear in court, she had to run the gauntlet. Was there a feeling of a witch hunt? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, much was made to do about the silly string tape. Yes. At the graveside. Which is not a criminal offense. It is not a criminal offense. The defense attorney agreed for that to come in. And it, the, the theory was that you could look at a woman who's, you know, uh, some days after her children have been slaughtered at her feet and she's been left for dead, that you can look at her, that we, the public, can look at her, jurors can look at her and decide, yes, she's a killer. Yes, she killed her own children. Um, that's absurd on its face, but yet that was the basis for the, the prosecutor said when he saw that on the, on the TV news that he knew that she had done it. My sister and her boyfriend had brought silly string because the boys, anybody that knew my boys, they constantly were playing with silly string around the neighborhood. They were <laughs> just, that was one of the things they loved to do. And so that was done in honor of them. That was done in love of them, of, of celebration of what they would want. And the prosecution took about a minute of that whole entire day of me on the grave spraying <coughs> silly string. And that's what they showed the jurors. I remember the first time I saw that, I was at home watching the news. And, uh, and I just, you know, as a parent, I'm sitting there trying to conceive of this, how any, any parent in that position could possibly be doing something like that. It disgusted me. It uh, troubled me. Um, it just, again, it's just one of those things that you want to get your, wrap your mind around. You can't do it. Uh, it's inconceivable. Um, I do remember when that was played in the courtroom. And I remember the reaction of the jurors, and their reactions, I think, were the same as when I had seen it for the first time. Um, disbelief. How can a mother who's lost two children be out there laughing, uh, cutting up, joking, and playing around at a gravesite when she's just lost two of her children? Uh, because, you know, again, as a parent, I hate to even think about losing a, one Yes, of, but it is child. not a criminal offense. No, but I think it was proper for that jury to see her response. I would contest that because uh, you would show such a video in the face of uh, punishment. Well, and let's That's also... That's where it belongs, in my opinion. The jury apparently saw the 
video nine times during deliberations. Right. Again, her whole story to the jury was she loved her children more than anything in the world. She was a doting mother. She was, you know, would never do anything. After the trial was over, we repeatedly heard that, you know. The silly, I mean, we didn't hear anything else but that. The silly string tape, the silly string tape, the silly string tape. And, and who would have ever thought that you could be sentenced to death on a can of silly string? Again, I think it just shows her nature. She loves to be the center of attention. She wants people to look at her and to believe an image. I mean, this is, this is who you're dealing with. We saw the same thing in Kerrville when we tried the case the very first day before we started selecting the jury. I remember the complaint from the defense. It was an odd that she was angry that she had not had the opportunity to get her hair done the night before. <laughs> uh, we, we looked at each other uh, as prosecutors and as did we really hear that. Her, her complaint was that she didn't get her hair done. She, she didn't look the way she wanted to look. I mean, she's very much on the physical. The outward appearance is always important to her. Um, and she's always trying to sell herself in one way or another. You can if you choose to get up and, and fix your hair, and you can do that if you want to do that. Some makeup? Some makeup. They have a few things that you can buy off the commissary, the prison commissary. You want to look beautiful, even in isolation? I think as women, you know, I think it makes you feel better if you can get up and do those things. And, and just, it, it's part of a, maybe like, makes you feel like that's part of a normal process that you had when you were out in the world, so yeah. What looks like a series of glamour shots of Darley was actually taken on death row. She's only allowed to wear her prison jumpsuit. Well, I had this one dream, and this is very personal for me. I've only shared this with my mom and my pastor, and it's a very, very personal dream, but I want to share it because it's very, um, it's very amazing. After not too long, I was still at the county, and I hadn't been convicted yet, and um, I had a dream that I was at my grandparents' house. And I was sitting, I came into the house, and Devin and Damon were both in there. And I didn't understand the dream at the time, the significance of Devin and Damon didn't have clothes on. But they were perfect. Their skin was perfect, their hair, everything, they just, they looked perfect. And um, when I went into the living room, I sat down in a chair, and Damon came and sat in my lap. And in my grandparents' house, there's a big, huge window right in front of that chair. And I started talking to Damon. And I remember... I was looking at him, and he looked so perfect. He just was just glowing. He was just... And he was smiling. And I said... I remember saying... You know, baby, I miss you. And he didn't say nothing. He just kept smiling at me. And I said, I kind of got sad for a minute. And I said, you know, why did you have to leave me? And he just kept smiling at me. And then I just, you know, I just was taken in his beauty. And I said, are you with Jesus? And he just smiled so big. And, um... He just kept just smiling. He never said anything, but he just kept smiling so big. And that moment, it was just a minute after I had asked him if he was with Jesus, this bright white light that was so bright, I couldn't even, it was like a blinding light, filled that whole room, that whole window that was right there in front of the chair, filled the whole room. I woke up instantly. I felt
felt like that was God's way of giving me a comfort to know that they are with Him. She always is going to portray herself as a victim, as pitiful, as grieving, um, as a, a victim of some injustice. Uh, this, this, is, this is what she does, and she's done it for 15 years now. If you close your eyes, you walk out of this here, what will you do first? Well, I always had this picture in my mind of falling on my knees and my son running into my arms. Of course, he was little bitty. He's too big for <laughs> He was that. little <laughs> then, so now it's like, you know, he'll be picking me up. And, and, but I, I just, yes, I have not got to hold my son in 16 years. Holding my son and, and, you know, my family, my mother, she's been through so much through this. And um, just being able to grieve, to have a chance to properly grieve for my children that I have not been able to do because I've had to put that somewhere else so I can be strong to fight and do what I need to do to prove I didn't do this.